right. Um, thank you very much for being here at 10 a.m. in the morning on a Sunday. Um, everyone who talk, uh, talked to me over the last past days, I always say, like, hey, don't go to the talks, just watch a live recording, but unfortunately I need to be here. Uh, but great that you're here, so um, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so um, today I will do another vacuum robot uh, talk and uh, this time we take a look at robots which have cameras and I know this is like every two years it's more or less sounds like the same talk but sadly there's always a lot of development and the vendors are not the smartest ones always um, so see is as an update. All right, um, so um, some information about me so that you have some idea what the heck I'm doing. Um, I'm a PhD student in Boston at Northeastern University and I primarily do uh, research in uh, wireless and uh, embedded devices. So I'm interested in uh, security and privacy. Um, I think I call myself now also a vacuum robot collector because I have many, many, many of them. So some people collect stamps, I collect vacuum robots. Um, and I'm interested in reverse engineering interesting uh, devices. Um, robots, obviously, but uh, right now I'm also looking at smart speakers, flash memory, everything which is kind of interesting, has internet and can do uh, interesting things. Um, some of my um, past projects, to give you some idea why I'm doing things, how I do them, um, I had like a paper some time ago um, about Amazon Echo devices where I did forensics about like 87 or 86 used devices from eBay and was doing forensics on them. Let's say the outcome was not very good for Amazon. Um, some other things which I do right now is like flash forensics, so I look at embedded devices and see what kind of information I can extract from them. Um, but I'm looking also at flash firmware itself, so flash memory has sometimes firmware onto it and I'm looking if I can, you know, use it for something interesting. Um, another project which I run primarily is uh, robotinfo.dev. Um, this is like a website where you have like a systematic, you know, list of uh, robots which I have. Um, sorted by operation systems, sensors, vulnerabilities. Um, my primary um, focus here is like security and privacy um, and one of the things which I also do with that um, is also tracking of firmware changes. We will see later that um, tracking of firmware changes can be very, very useful and can save you a lot of time. Um, yeah. Um, one of the stories how I get my information is, I mean, I have the devices myself and then as soon as I disconnect them from, from the cloud, I basically emulate them in the cloud. So the vendor thinks that they're still online, but I just use it to scrape the data. Um, and this is also like a base for um, further research. Um, as you can see in the picture, by the way, this is like one of my two or three shelves which I have. So I have from each of the robots which I root, I have like a reference model. If I need to test something, just go to my shelf, just grab one, test whatever I want and just put it back on the shelf. Which means I have no idea which robot cleans the best because I'm root of them but I don't actually use them for cleaning. So I get this question quite often. I, I have no idea. I have one which cleans it. It's fine. So uh, no idea about that. Um, all right. So what's the goal of this talk? Um, I want to give you some um, overview of the development of vacuum robot hacking over the last five years. Um, I want to give you also some, some insight of vulnerabilities and vectors and I want to give you an idea about the current um, uh, routing methods for current robots. Um, the automotive goal which we have typically is that we have root access at some point on a robot without disassembling it because disassembly is always warranty seals and stuff. Um, one quick notice, um, we don't necessarily hate um, the robot companies, I mean it's like more or less like a competition. Sometimes I visited them and had a nice chat and next week I rooted their devices so it's, it's kind of nice. So it's a, it's a nice um, kind of thing. So, um, what kind of devices were uh, covered today in the talk? Um, and there's a kind of long list, technically there's even a longer list, but um, primarily we have the companies Roborock, uh, we have Dreamy. Um, a lot of things which I do today apply also to many, many, many other devices, not only vacuum robots, but um, lawnmowers, smart speakers and other things. Um, all the devices which are underlined are ones which uh, have cameras. Um, and the ones which are indirectly is like um, technically I have it, but it doesn't make sense for me to actually root it and develop tooling. So if you want to port it, you can do it, but um, yeah, just as information. So um, let's talk about this talk. Um, so the, this talk is more or less the result of like 15 months of research and experiments. So I do that for a very long time. And it's a little bit annoying to sit on things for a very long time. So if you know like, okay, I can get access on this device, but I can't tell anyone how. Um, which is very annoying. Um, and also this talk is a, a collaborative effort between me and Zuren Bayer. And Zuren is one of the, or is the developer of Valetudo, which is the cloud replacement for robots. Uh, so he uh, plays a very, very important role in this, um, in this endeavor. Um, the other thing is, 
all this work wouldn't be uh, possible if you wouldn't have the community. So we have thousands of people who are making robots and who are like, tinkering around with them. I cannot have every device so far and uh, help, uh, thankfully people are testing things and this is kind of great. Um, as a general information, um, in this talk you're the, you learn about vulnerabilities the same time as the vendors do. So right now I know that some companies in China are watching this talk live and I will get some emails afterwards. Um, but expect some patches coming in the next days so they don't know what we do. So just as information. All right. So what's the motivation for this talk? Um, well, why do we root devices in the first place? And a lot of people think like, okay, I mean, I can just use it. Why, why the heck do I need to root it? Well, these devices are very, very cool hardware. Think of uh, um, a Raspberry Pi on tires, uh, which has tires like cool sensors and can drive around in your apartment. Um, it's a very compact, nice unit, um, which you can, you know, do a lot of experiments with. Um, the other thing is we obviously want to stop devices from constantly uh, phoning home and you will be surprised how much they phone home. So it's like one device can produce hundreds of megabytes of log files, maps, whatever, every month, which is like getting uploaded. So if you have a, uh, um, some um, internet tariff which has um, um, limitations of like volume, you might think about that. Um, the other thing is uh, a lot of people like to have um, some custom smart home solutions. So like um, Home Assistant is one of the examples. It makes it way easier to obviously connect the device if you have um, a rooted device. Um, a thing which becomes more and more important uh, also with the right of repair, um, by rooting devices or having the tools at least to be able to do so, we can diagnose broken devices. Um, especially in the US there's a problem that you have a warranty of one year and these robots tend to break after one year, so um, it's very useful that we can figure out, okay, what's, what's going on with devices. And we want to verify our privacy claims. Companies can say a lot of things if the day is long and marketing people can do that too, but we want to actually know if it's true or not. So why don't we trust the nice companies and why don't we trust IoT? Well, imagine this device is connected to your home network and has access to everything which is in your home if it's in the same network. And it has its own internet connection basically to back to the cloud. Which means um, in most of the time the, this communication is encrypted and you have no idea what's sending back. It has cameras, it ha might have microphones, it, might, it has a, you know, a map of your home, it can drive around on its own and you have no idea what's running on it. Also, even if the vendor is not malicious, uh, developing secure hardware and software is uh, really hard. And if you remember the Mirai, net, uh, frame, um, the Mirai botnet, um, where basically a lot of IP cameras got hacked and millions of, you know, basically botnets were created, um, this is kind of like a thing where we want to just make sure that, you know, there's nothing, you know, which the vendor accidentally left in there and forgot about. Um, and one of the things is also that a lot of vendor claims uh, contradict each other, and I have one perfect example for that. Um, which I always use, so it's like uh, if, you, if you were here in, uh, two years ago, you probably know it, uh, just, you know, for the newcomers. Um, Roborock, I mean, I, I shame a little bit of Roborock, but all the companies do that, by the way. Um, they claim for their robots with cameras, nothing is ever sent to the cloud. Um, we will never duplicate data, the data is not stored on the device, and we don't send, send camera pictures on, like, to, to the cloud, so you will, you're safe. The camera is just used to kind of detect objects. But if you scroll down on a page back then, you find like, oh, by the way, you can also access the camera remotely to watch your pets. So, okay, so you're not sending it to the cloud, but I can still access it remotely, so how does it work? Um, another thing um, which came out uh, a couple months ago, and I was also like a little bit involved in that, um, iRobot got caught that they basically upload uh, pictures of cameras of robots um, to the cloud and then giga workers uh, or gig workers in Venezuela kind of labeling them. So there's an interesting article. Um, I linked it also like in the uh, foot, foot line. Um, and so what happened is basically, this were development devices, so people got free devices and had to sign some terms of service where we kind of agreed to that, but no one actually knew that they agreed to that. And so people started to kind of, um, so this devices started to upload pictures and for whatever reason, iRobot was very interested that, that, that you had like a, you know, fan and like lights and whatever in your, in your apartment. For whatever reason, we wanted to have it labeled. Um, a fun fact of that is as soon as the article came out or shortly before that, a lot of vendors started to panic and I saw a lot of firmware changes and I saw a lot of changes in like privacy policies for all the companies. So they got really, really spooked by that. Not that it actually changes a lot, but I mean some of the firmware actually started to doing pictures because we got scared they get also caught like, like um, iRobot. Um, 
the other interesting uh, thing which we see nowadays is um, devices get more and more sensors and I have an example here from Echovox which we don't talk about this talk today but just an ex as an example. They have cameras but they started also to introduce microphones. Um, we made like five years ago with Daniel um, uh, Wegema who I was starting this research with um, a joke like oh we can maybe try to use the ultrasonic sensor as a microphone so we can spy on people or we can use some other sensors to you know get like some audio information or like you know visual information. Nowadays we are here basically like oh we have cameras and microphones already on board so we don't need to kind of think of like sketchy ways to kind of get to the audio stream. Um, right. Another thing which we need to talk about is what, what are the risks of, uh, the, of devices with cameras. Um, a lot of devices might store uh, pictures indefinitely um, and basically both in the cloud and locally and from what I can tell so far is many do so. So basically um, I have like a research project running where we look at you know uh, what kind of data is like stored where and um, a lot of pictures are stayed, staying basically forever. Um, the other thing which might be problematic is if you are a um, shopper at Mar Amazon marketplace and you get like used devices, um, I'm not sure if it's a good idea. Um, partially because whoever had the device before could have installed a rootkit and you as a new owner you have no idea what's, what's going on there. So even if you do a factory set the, the malicious firmware might still be on. With the result that you have a malicious firmware, uh, sorry, malicious device in your network which has you know all the access. Um, by the way if you learn today how to root devices don't buy Amazon devices. Root them and send them back. That's evil. That's bad. That's hopefully. I think that's illegal. So, uh, don't do that. Very bad. All right. So, um, which means rooting is more or less the only way how you can verify whether the device is clean. Uh, so there's literally no other way to kind of know that. Um, by the way, the vendors are kind of aware that pe that people and uh, cybersecurity uh, um, people are kind of scared of cameras, so they try to avoid the word camera. So instead um, you know they say like oh we, this device doesn't have a camera. We have um, optical sensor. And I have here an article from like a German thing but uh, a German page but um, there's also um, English speaking pages which have like you know marketing material from Roborock. And I kind of said like well we don't have a camera in the actual sense. We have an optical sensor which detects a couple things. Well on the right you see an output of this optical sensor. <laughs> this uh, looks kind of to me like a picture, but I mean, it must be it must be an optical sensor. So, um, yeah, this is a from a Roborock uh, S8 Pro Ultra from the optical sensor. So, yeah, don't believe marketing material. Um, the other thing is, everyone loves certifications. So, all the devices we're talking about today uh, have some sort of certification by my favorite company in Germany, TÜV, which is certifying a lot of things if the day is long. Um, and all of the devices are uh, certified by the European uh, cybersecurity standards for uh, IoT products. So I think because we're certified we can stop the talk here because we're secure I assume. Um, yeah so the takeaway lesson at some point just to kind of you know give you already like a spoiler is uh, don't trust certifications. Uh, they don't necessarily mean anything. All right so what happened so far? Uh, in the past over the last five years. Well one of the general observations which I did was every time a routing method is presented or released uh, the vendors react in one way or the other. Um, sometimes we even break things in the process. So I, we saw in the past like a vendor which kind of panicked a little bit when we released the routing method and they created a firmware update which started to break hundreds of vacuum robots um, which were not recoverable anymore. So yeah. Um, the best case for us if they fix things is that the routing method just fails that the device says like hey it's invalid I don't boot. The worst case which is and some vendors do that actually they the routing succeeds but the device breaks randomly. So you let it run it will stop randomly after five minutes or ten minutes or whatever. We will see a, we'll show an example in a, you know um, in the next slides um, where we saw that. Or the device might also destroy it themselves. So some uh, we saw in one case where basically if the device detects that it has been rooted, it will just you know destroy itself, uh, which is bad. Um, all right, let's look in the past. So the first work um, of the vacuum cleaning which I was doing uh, was in 2017, and this was together with Danny Wegema, who has, by the way, talk in at 11 a.m. So if you're interested in um, um, I think he does uh, chipsets, uh, like wireless chipsets. Um, then he has a talk in track fee. Um, and the, um, the robot which we were back then analyzing was the first generation of Xiaomi robots and the first generation of Roborock robots. Um, some of the things which we figured out is that the firmware updates are unsigned and um, encrypted with a very weak key, which was, I think, the company name Roborock. 
which wouldn't it's itself be an issue on its own. I mean, that's kind of like not great, but I mean, the bigger problem was that you could push a custom firmware from the local network onto the device. Uh, and because the, 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 you know, the thing was kind of clear, um, so the, the password was kind of known, people could do that maliciously. You cannot only do that from the local network, but you can do it also from, for unprovisioned devices. And I was telling the story like two, two days ago in my demo lab where um, I was in Germany and I saw one of the neighbors had a Roborock robot, which was unprovisioned, so it had an open Wi-Fi access point, and I was like, <sighs> I didn't do it. I just want to say I didn't do it, but you can do that. So, so make sure that your device is provisioned, because otherwise someone else can provision it for you. Just a side note. Um, right, so what was the result? Um, we could easily root devices because we could just push firmware updates and it was great for the development of, uh, of like custom software and voice packages. Um, right. And we published that uh, at the CCC Congress in 2017 and I was giving a talk exactly five years ago on the day here at DEF CON. So um, it's, a, it's a very long run of you know, research. So after that, Roborock was, let's say, not directly happy. We started to do a couple things. Um, for example, we blocked the local updates, which was not necessarily bad. I mean, I think from a security perspective, this was good. Um, then they started to introduce with newer models um, firmware signatures and um, signed also voice packages. And they used different keys for different devices, so we couldn't you know, decrypt devices, uh, firmware for different devices anymore with one key. Um, one thing which we didn't like, um, they started to sign files for uh, region logs. So if you buy a device from China, you couldn't run it in the US. They, you know, cracked down on that. Um, on the other side, all the hardware remained the same. So if you buy a device like from five years ago and you buy a device from like two years ago, they have more or less the same board, the same hardware. Um, that's kind of a business model of, you know, generating revenue. Um, the bad news of after they fixed that was that we had to basically disassemble the devices and this is um, a little bit of a problem. So, we developed a new routing method which works, uh, worked for um, Roborock S7, S5 Max, S7, S7 and others. And the initial idea was, okay, we can just connect over UART and can do the U-boot shell thing, so, which you can do for many, many devices um, to get root access. Um, however, we blocked that at some point and um, instead we de developed a method where you can basically bring the device in bootloader mode and just start to patch it from, uh, the, the system from there. Um, the disadvantage here was obviously we need to disassemble it, potentially solder things, so it's um, kind of a problem. One of the interesting facts is this method still works today for many, many devices which are based on the Allwinner R16 um, chipset. Um, so even if you buy today a uh, newer Roborock like the Q Q7 or something, it still works for whatever reason, so that's, that's a good thing. Um, after that, they started to react, obviously. Uh, one of the things is we removed like the U-boot shell so that we couldn't do that. And for their flagship models, we started to introduce like a lot of mean things. Uh, CQ boot, SA Linux, DM Verity, we put that in the firmware. Um, and they, newer, even newer models started to use uh, encrypted file systems where they, uh, the user data application was encrypted so you couldn't access machine learning models, you couldn't access, you know, anything which is on the device. And they started to put these keys into a uh, trust zone. So. Uh, you need to boot in secure boot mode uh, so that you can access the key. So they put a lot of effort in like, securing that. One thing which, they, which was very mean is they started to put like custom stuff in the kernel. For example, they added an ELF binary signature check in the kernel so you couldn't run any uh, unsigned binaries, which is a little bit annoying if you got some way in and tried to run something you have and it just says like, no, it's not signed, so screw you. Um, Right, so in 2021, again here at DEF CON, um, I, st I figured out a way how to bypass all the stuff. Um, the initial idea was basically um, I need to disassemble the device and modify the configuration partition, which required either EMMC desoldering or ISP access, so which is very, very complicated. So it's a thing which, you know, a very small percentage of people can do, but it's very tricky. Um, also back in 2021, because we got a little bit tired with Roborock and their counter measurements, uh, we figured out that there's a new vendor, which is Dreamy. Um, and their devices were kind of powerful um, because we had cameras and other things. Um, they were easy to route just by a connector, um, by USB. Um, but the problem was a little bit that the devices got so soft break from time to time, but we kind of fixed that. So, what was the Roborox reaction? Exactly one day after uh, the uh, DEF CON talk, I got a e nice email from the Roborox CEO. Thanks for the talk. Our engineers were watching the talk live, so I assume we're watching it right now. And they're fixing right now the vulnerabilities and pushing out the updates. <laughs> so, um, 
now what we do is like all the partitions are encrypted except for the system partition which we can't do for particular reasons. Um, we started to obfuscate the ELF binary check verification. Um, so it cost us more time to figure out what we do. And we added custom code to detect that we root devices and to bypass um, our traffic. So typically what we do is like we, when we disconnect a device from the cloud, we reroute the traffic so that it ends up in our custom software. We figured out a way to detect that and basically still send out the traffic to the real Roborock servers. Um, which was very mean. I mean, we figured it out, but it was kind of like a little bit weird, like, wait, we rooted this device, why is it still sending stuff back home? Uh, so we basically um, put hooks, like obfuscated hooks in the lib curl library. Um, so every time HTTP requests happening, they, they match for, is it the Roborock URL? If it is, then do like a silent DNS check themselves and kind of, you know, send it like silently. And we are big fans of XOR, so they XOR the, like everything out of like all the strings in, from all the binaries. So um, we really want to make it hard for us, but we don't use strings on the you know thing. Um, as an example for their creativity, so they uh, like I mentioned before, they added um, ELF signature checks in the kernel. And what we do is typically we uh, we map the uh, do mm map um, function, which creates I think the, the memory area for like a binary if you execute it. So if you execute like a unsigned binary, you get just a sec fault if the signature is invalid. And they got very, very creative with names. So um, I have an example here. So they, um, this security function can be called like clock set rate DSP, clock get rate DSP, um, and all the other names, right? So it's kind of like if you look at that, you think like, oh yeah, I mean that's that's you know that needs to be there. But in reality, we try just to kind of be sneaky and obfuscate things. They get really, really creative with the names, uh, but not creative enough. If you Google for these functions, you not, don't find anything except for rock. So um, well, maybe we should be a little bit more creative. Um, Dreamy panicked also at this time. Um, they were kind of new. We um, did a lot of changes to the firmware, so they pushed like one firmware update after another. They removed our UART login shell and they patched the UBoot shell. Um, and some of the changes apparently did break a lot of robots. Um, there was like some kind of thing which we didn't test it properly. We pushed the firmware update and a lot of robots were kind of very sad afterwards. Um, a fun fact is, um, their patches revealed a way easier method to root the devices which we actually knew. So one thing which we do is typically we, um, you know, compare all the firmware updates and see like, okay, what did they change? This happens fully automatic. And um, one thing which we noticed like, oh, they, they, they changed this thing. Um, so typically we would um, kind of do like a sketchy way to like of, of, of flashing the, the robot by USB and if USB cable is kind of janky, it might break the robot, so it's very, very dangerous. Then we saw that we patched a function out, which basically if you press the reset button for like one second, it will pop your shell. Um, and we saw that and we were like, great, this is way safer because you are, I mean, you cannot break things that, that easily. So uh, thanks, Dreamy, for telling us about this thing. So we, did, we weren't even aware of that. I mean, I didn't have any idea that this exists in there. Um, in 2022, when we started to kind of more focus on dreamy robots and root these devices, they introduced more, uh, more and more counter measurements. Um, one of them was, but obviously they enabled secure boot and set of e fuses, which was kind of to be expected. Um, they started to sign the um, system partition in a weird way and verified it in the bootloader. And they started to pair the kernel with a particular uh, version of file system. Um, which on itself is not a problem, but the next step is kind of the annoying part. They and um, introduced um, judge, we call it like that, countermeasure into the software. What, was this, what is this judge doing? Well, it's, they introduced it in all the firmwares in uh, 2022, and it will randomly crash the robot while cleaning if it attacks the manipulation of the firmware. So what it does is it uh, um, has like an expected SHA-256 value and it baked into the kernel, and the process, um, uh, as soon as you start to run it, it will basically compute a hash of the system partition and compare them. If it doesn't match, it will basically create a thread which will allocate lots of lots of memory. So after a random time, it's not even so that it's like three minutes, it can be 15 minutes, it can be anything. This, the robot will just stop and crash and reboot. And imagine how difficult it is to f figure that out. Uh, it took us like like weeks to figure out like, wait, is this like a thing which is, we messed up something? Is it, what is it? Because there's no log files, it's not reproducible like in a, in a very efficient manner. Until on some point we figured out like, oh, wait, this, this thing is happening and um, so we patch it out nowadays for like firmware which we kind of release. But this is extremely mean. This is like one of the cases where I'm saying like, okay, just tell us that, that we messed up, it's, it's fine. Don't be sneaky and you know, kind of annoy us with that. Okay, so what is the current state of robot security today? Um, and I have an example here um, which is probably one of the most 
or best protected uh, robots so far in the market, which is the Roborock um, S8 Pro Ultra, which is, I think, the top on the stack. Um, it's the current flagship model. It came out a couple months ago. Um, it's a, it has a, a um, quad core all winner SOC and multiple MCUs. Um, we got a little bit cheap, so the initial models came out of one gigabyte of RAM, but at some point we figured out, like, oh, hey, we can get away with 512, so newer releases have like 512 megabyte of RAM. Um, we have four gigabyte of flash, we have two cameras, um, LiDAR sensor, and uh, two lasers. Security wise, we kind of checked everything in the book basically secure boot, uh, the MBRT protected root FS, looks and crook partitions, SA Linux uh, of signatures, so um, the standard stuff what we have. Um, let me give you a quick intro how the booting process looks like. And this is a very simplified version. I know it, it, at the end of the day it will look very, very complicated, but uh, just to, for you to understand, okay, what, we, what are we doing? What is our leverage? Um, if, the, if the device boots up, uh, it boots from a boot ROM which is baked into the SOC. Uh, it will then verify the first stage bootloader, which initializes also RAM. And the first stage bootloader will then check the signature of like a thing which is called talk one. This is like just a term, technical term, ignore that for now. The talk one, what it will do is it will uh, start the um, trust zone components, opti in this particular case, which will then verify U-boot and launch the actual U-boot um, um, bootloader. Uh, the U-boot bootloader gets like its configuration and um, basically, for example, which partition to boot and will launch and verify uh, the Linux kernel. The Linux kernel itself will then verify the root file system and check if it's correctly signed, and we'll start the, all the software, which it will also check if it's correctly signed. So the software itself, the ELF binaries are signed. Then we used opt again to retrieve the keys for the, for the system partitions and for the data partition, and then we'll decrypt the uh, software partition and user data partition. So there's a lot of stuff in there, and it's like, all right, everything checks everything, so what the heck do, are, are we doing here, right? Well, does it, actually. Uh, there's one thing which is maybe not checked in the way it should be checked. The boot, let's talk about the bootloader. So the U-boot bootloader is um, more or less a de facto standard thing for embedded devices. It's a very powerful software. It sets up some hardware at, at, at the boot, boot up process. It sends uh, the uh, command line arguments for the kernel. It verifies the kernel in this particular case and boots it. Um, and it uses environment partition or configuration to configure itself. For example, it's, it's used for um, if you want to update like a partition, you have typically two copies of a partition. If you want to update copy B, uh, you can control it over U-boot. On the other side, U-boot has a very powerful command set. It can do a lot of things. For example, allowing to um, load partitions, access memory, changing memory, because sometimes you need that to um, set up hardware. Um, the thing which I was wondering about was like, huh, okay, it can access and change memory. I wonder if we can use that for something. So the idea was, can we ask U-boot nicely to modify itself? So the theory is if you have memory reads and writes, um, we might be able to overwrite instructions in the U-boot itself, which, for example, checks, verifies like, the kernel signature. So what, we had to do a little bit of math. So we have to figure out, like, basically, where is the actual signature function, which was a little bit tricky to figure out if you don't have the source code. Um, then we have to figure out the uh, U-boot relocation uh, offset, because we, you know, um, there's some technical reason behind that. And so we need to figure out where is this function in the memory. And then at the end of the day, um, we figured out where it is, and then we patch, basically, we set, we set two bytes in, the, in one particular memory location, and this disables all the verifications uh, forward, forward after reboot. The interesting thing is the device is still in secure boot mode. Nothing notices that something is going wrong. Everything is fine. So what's the consequence of that? And if we go back into our original example, if we have a malicious U-boot configuration, well, um, U-boot patches itself, so U-boot is compromised. Um, because we have U-boot compromised, we compromise the verification check. Then we can compromise the kernel because nothing is checking it anymore. If we compromise the kernel, then the kernel doesn't check anymore the root file system or the software. And because Opti never learns that anything bad happened, uh, it will happily give us the keys which we need to do partitions um, and uh, everything works. So this system is more or less screwed. So what did we achieve with this small one line thing? Uh, we bypassed the secure boot process. Um, we modified the kernel, um, which means we removed the DMVerity checks, we removed the ELF binary checks, and we uh, disabled SE Linux. And this allows us uh, to modify the root file system. So we're back in the game, basically. 
Um, and uh, with that, we can also install um, custom software and get SSH access. The interesting thing is when we were playing around with this model, uh, with this uh, approach, I mean, it's kind of known that uh, the environment partitions is kind of like a problem, but most of the time people use it to kind of boot like their own shell scripts. But in this particular case, we can just patch the U boot persistently. Um, and not only on raking robots, but we tested this also for smart speakers, media devices, um, and many, many other devices. So if you happen uh, um, to have a device which uses U boot and, you know, which is kind of locked, and you might want to try that. It's a little bit of effort in like getting it to run initially, but it's definitely worth it. So we still have a problem. Well, how do we modify um, the environment? Because, I mean, it's like on a flash, so we, we don't have access. Well, without root access, we, we can, you know, modify it directly. We cannot also modify the, the root file system, so we cannot put our custom software onto it. And we don't want to disorder the flash. So the good news is we found for um, the typical uh, models different, different methods. For the older um, dreamy vacuum robots, uh, we found the USB stick method, which again, they left us, thankfully. Um, for newer models, which came out re very, very recently, we have like an FL root, like it's bootloader root. And for the Roborock models, we have a scary FEL root. I will explain why we call it scary. So, as a, a quick recap, if you have been here two years ago, um, Dreamy uh, thankfully has the bug pins which are reachable from outside, so you can just remove like a cover. It sounds a little bit scary if you kind of remove, like, pull on it the first time, but it's very easily removable. It gives you a UART, it gives you like USB, it gives you everything. Um, the same is the case, I mean, we never changed it, so even for the new models, for the R models, which are the ones which are came, in, came out after 2022, they still use the same thing. So. Um, again, a thing which we kind of figured out by looking at firmware updates, uh, Jimmy left us a nice backdoor. Um, basically, if you connect a USB stick, an empty USB stick, it doesn't matter what USB stick it is, um, to the USB port, it will pop a shell. And at some point, I think we plan to have some actual verification there. But as you see, it's, if the verification fails, it still gets you a shell. So I think this was a work in progress and someone forgot about that. Um, so that way, we. As you see, it, it doesn't matter if the if is, is, is doing anything or not, uh, you will always get a shell. Um, so after you get uh, access basically to the shell, you can just patch environment and you're good to go. Um, the sad news is they, for whatever reason, we have two branches and for the newer R models in 2022, they don't, uh, they, they have like a more, a, a better check and uh, so it doesn't work there. Instead, uh, we developed this method uh, where we basically bring the um, bootloader, uh, so the device into a particular bootloader mode, and then we have a weird, sketchy firmware package which we install with a very sketchy software. And uh, it doesn't actually install any firmware, but it gives you like an interface uh, to the flash and to some other system functions, which surprisingly, uh, if you um, connect over USB in the bootloader mode, you don't need to have signed firmware. So you can execute unsigned code over USB, you don't have access to Trust Zone, but that's fine for us. We just just want to have access to the flash, and from there we could just modify the flash. So um, it, um, I have a how-to here. The technical process is a little bit complicated, but we did like lots of pictures, and so um, don't worry. I mean, many people did that already and tested it, thankfully, and didn't break their devices. Well, one did, but we fixed it, so it should be safe. At this time, it should be safe. I kind of promise. Um, if you want to get an adapter, I have some adapters with me. Um, you can just grab one. Um, sadly, I, I, I got rid of 100 adapters two days ago in my demo session, but I still have some left. Um, otherwise, you find the Gerber files on this website. Let's talk about this scary FAL route. Um, the problem with Roborock is they didn't give us any exposed debug pins. So we have only like USB available from outside, which we cannot really use. So the first approach, which I typically do is, all right, I buy the device, I spend $1,000 and disassemble it and, you know, analyze it. I, I remove the SOC, which is like hundreds of p pins, and try to track down where which pin is. Um, I remove also, obviously, the EMMC and read the EMMC out to kind of figure out what's going on. And then I start uh, to map all the pins, like, visually. So I, I use my favorite hacking software, MS Paint, and kind of overlay the pictures. <laughs> and. Uh, I'll rotate one so that I can basically trace down like, okay, this is the data line from the EMMC, it goes in this via, and it comes out on the other side, as you can see, uh, ah, the picture is a little bit weird, it comes out, out from the other side, and you know, so you can basically connect uh, these pictures. One thing which we figured out, and Roborock was very, very great with layouting it, um, you can access all the EMMC data pins from the whole, from the button, which is 
You just remove the cover, there's a, just, just some rubber thing. You don't need to disassemble the robot. No warranty seals are broken. You can access the data pins from outside, which is great for us. So as you see, we have uh, data zero, data one, and all the error pins, the clock. We have everything, which is very nice. So now we come to the scary part. Um, we can use a needle to basically um, ground the data zero pin to, uh, to, to uh, well, connect the data zero pin to ground, and that will bring the device into um, the bootloader mode, and then we can just flash it from USB. So without disassembling, without touching any single screw, you can just, you know, just scratch off a little bit of solar mask, you connect like a wire to it, just hold it and power it on, and then it should be in, 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 the, in the bootloader mode. Um, so it's more or less the same approach for the Dreamy, so it's like um, just in this particular case, you need to be a little bit more scary. Um, why is it scary? Well, it requires removal of solar mask, you need to scratch a little bit. If you don't, if you're comfortable with that, you still need to tear it down. Um, but if you're unsure, ask other users. There's a lot of people who do that. Um, if you have a different uh, robot uh, from Roborock, um, like a G10S, which is very often used in Russia right now, I heard. Um, it's more or less the same process as for the other robots, but you need to disassemble it because we don't have any access from outside. I checked all the, you know, possibilities of like burning holes into the board, but sadly that doesn't work. Um, so um, check also my website, Robot Info, for the pinouts and ask uh, for help in the community. Right. Um, what do we do with root access? Um, so we have root access now in some way. So what do we do now? We defeated Secure Boot. We can run custom software. But what kind of software can we run? And can we build our own software which kind of does everything? Well, we are a little bit lazy. So we actually, our main idea is, well, we just want to disconnect the cloud but keep all the vendor cleaning logic in place. Because, I mean, we are not software engineers, so we're just hackers. So we, you know, if the robot works, then, you know, it's still fine. So if you get rid of the cloud, the robot should still work. But the problem is, like, well, we don't have live maps. We don't have advanced features like uh, map editing. So, you know, why did we even root it if we just, you know, cut the internet? So, um, and what happens if you need to redirect the traffic? So the, um, the problem is like we use obviously secrets uh, or, as, uh, or, or keys and so we need to extract them from the robot and point it like to like a cloud emulation. So it's a little bit tricky, right? But we can do that. So the initial approach which we had was quite naive. So we just redirect DNS uh, to our own software and you know, we just use IP tables. But Xiaomi kind of figured, figured out that oh, um, people do that so they kind of introduce like hard coded IP addresses in their binaries. Our solution was basically to just, you know, replace their hard-coded IP addresses with our hard-coded IP addresses. So it's just, just an additional step. So uh, as you see, we are kind of aware of what we do, and then we do the same things basically in reverse. Which means uh, we can run our own software and we can redirect the traffic. Um, and there's a great software, which is Volatudo, which is uh, developed by Zoom. It's a, completely replace, a complete replacement of the, of the cloud um, applications and API and the, the app itself. It's, so you can run your vacuum robot completely offline with all the functionalities which, which the cloud and the API, uh, so the, the, the smartphone app offers you. You can see live maps, you can edit the maps, you can change the robot configuration. It's a very responsive app interface. Uh, it gives you an API for REST uh, and it gives you MQTT functionality, for example, for um, um, Home Assistant. The problem is, I mean, that's not a problem, but that's not my, my personal thing, is uh, Zero and Life's to write it in JavaScript and so no, no JS. I'm not sure if it's the most performant thing is, but no, it works, so it's, it's fine with me. Uh, some screenshots just to give you like information on how it looks like, so you, you get actually the maps, you can do a lot of interesting things with that. The question is now, how do you get the custom firmware? Um, I made something very, very easy, uh, which is called Dust Builder. It's basically a website where you can let the website build a custom firmware for you. You just you know, upload SSH key and do some other stuff. And it will give you like um, a custom firmware, which you can use when to push on your, on your robot. The, the scripts are technically uh, public on the GitHub, so you can just, you know, if you want to reproduce that, you can do that. So, last couple of minutes, that's the reason why I'm getting, getting a little bit faster. Uh, what else did we find on the robots while we're doing this uh, research? Well, all the cameras are, I mean, it's a Linux, Linux operation system on all the robots. So all the devices use the video for Linux subsystem and you can access the cameras uh, through their um, device um, um, file, basically. And some of the vendors were even nice enough to let uh, some, deb some debugging tools to, you know, debug the camera on the device. And I just want to give you some, some examples here. Uh, this is a, a G10S from Roborock. I made self, so it's self-aware, it makes a selfie of itself. And you see kind of like the quality again from the optical sensors. Um, 
for the Alten SU Ultra, they gave it a um, RGB camera, which is also nice. So you see again a selfie of a robot uh, with the DEFCON flag. And uh, on the right, you see like what's typical, what it typically sees um, with, with the camera if it kind of starts to detect AI um, with, the, with the AI um, um, objects in your in your house. Um, and this is the same example for uh, the uh, Roborock S8. It has an infrared camera, so the sad thing is on the right, as you see there, um, this looks a little bit bland. Um, this is the blue elephant, so you cannot see the blue in the picture, which is kind of sad, but um, it's okay. I mean, you s still see that the optical sensor sees something, right? Um, so something about the Dreamy. The good news is this year we didn't find any SSH credentials to their backend in the firmware, so that's good. They, they made a lot of improvements of the software, but the bad news is they started to introduce a lot of telemetry and calling home functions, which is a little bit sad. And they started to enforce geo-blocking by IP address. So if you buy a device from China again, you cannot use it anywhere outside of China. You need to kind of do some hacking, I guess. Um, there were a couple problems. Um, the, uh, so all the vacuum robots, what they do for legal reasons is if you access the camera remotely, it, the robot will say like, oh, live view is in, in effect, so be careful or whatever, um, which is kind of like a legal requirement. The problem is these audio files are kind of part of an ex like an audio packages and the audio packages are not signed or encrypted. So one thing you can do technically and don't do that because it's probably illegal in your, in your jurisdiction, you can just overwrite this prompt, this warning prompt, which the robot will kind of blare out every three minutes by an empty file and then you can access the camera without anyone noticing. Which is super illegal, don't do it. Um, the, the thing is, uh, you can do it also for non-rooted devices, which might be a problem. Um, one interesting thing is, um, Dreamy kind of messed up, by the way, the firmware signatures, um, so we didn't really use that, but I mean, it's kind of interesting. So we use encryption and signing, and the way how we do that is very interesting. The AutoZip archive is encrypted with a static password. Then they created a, um, a random file, which was signed with a private key, and then they use the random file as a password for another zip ar archive inside of the whole thing, which um, is basically the firmware. The problem is the actual firmware is not signed. The password is signed, but not the firmware. So the thing is, if you want to create your own custom firmware updates, you just you reuse the same password because it's already signed. So I think someone had a good effort. <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, we were not sure if it was a trick or if they kind of messed up. It was kind of a little bit weird. Anyway. So, last two slides. Um, as a summary, uh, we have routing methods for the most uh, current, uh, so most of the current release, uh, released uh, Dreamy and Roborock robots, and technically some others too. We can bypass secure boot, we can bypass any other security mechanisms. Um, we even routed devices which came out two weeks ago, so um, basically we are at the cutting edge here. Um, we get persistence and we can run our custom firmware. Um, now we can validate and verify the vendor's claims, and the bad news is some of them are tricky. Um, but the, the interesting thing here is the takeaway message. Um, even if you're not doing any robot hacking, the bootloader attack is technically applicable for many, many different other devices. Um, we saw it in, like I said, smart speakers and other, other things. And this routing allows us basically to do further research into IoT and AI because now we have access to the ma AI machine learning models and we can basically take a look at and compare them like more in a more um, qualitative way. So. The final notes, um, do not use your knowledge for bad things. I mean, I know people like to, to have the word burn down, but um, please don't do that. Um, help us to help others. Um, so if you have a rooting PCB, um, share it with other people as soon as you're done. Um, we will publish the tools in the next couple of years, some of, uh, sorry, next couple of years, <laughs> next couple of days. Um, so some of them are already public, some of them will be enabled in the next couple of hours when I'm kind of getting more cooled down. Uh, so please be patient if some things are not public yet. Um, if you happen to be a hardware I.O. in the Netherlands uh, in October or November, in the beginning of November, uh, feel free to join me. I might be there with some new things about regarding robots, which are not these robots, but some completely new company. All right. Um, fin final thing, um, I would like to thank uh, Danny Wigema, um, with whom I started to research. I uh, would also to thank Kevar Nabir, Zion Bayer, which is obviously the developer, and also Mikhail uh, Kalkin, and all the testers in the community. There were a lot of people who sacrificed, or nearly sacrificed their devices to test our routing methods. Thankfully, we have no brick devices so far, but I mean, it could have happened, and this would be kind of sad. I got like an email from one of the people like, oh, my wife would kill me if I destroy this device, so let's hope that um, it doesn't break. 
All right, and that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for being here again at 10 a.m. in the morning. <laughs>